everybody. Good morning to you. I'm going to tell you what, man, that was some fire, fire worship, man. Thank you, Chad and the team. Thank you, man. Thank you. Love your heart. I love your heart. Um, may you gift it, you're talented, man. You bring us along on a journey. That's what worship songs ought to do. They ought to bring us, um, they, they ought to really usher us into the presence of God so that our hearts are really ready for this. God's word, really, that's what it's all about. So I'm grateful for this moment. Uh, those tuning in, thank you. It's such a sensitive time. I mean, so you, you don't want to just jump right on in, right? So um, uh, <laughs> if he's done one thing for you, one thing. If he's done one thing for you, I want you to just, let, we need to let him know. On a, come on, come on, on the count of three, she already beat me, thank you. One, two, three, come on church. What he's done, what he's done, what he's done, not me. We're not talking about man, we're talking about the risen Savior who redeemed you, he brought you from darkness into his marvelous light. You are lost, now found, think about it, think about it. You are doomed to hell, but now you found grace. He gave you mercy for your misery. Come on, y'all. No, no, no. Come on. I'm, I'm like Chad, man. If y'all, man, hey, I'm going to tell you what. I should be strung out on drugs. I should be somewhere messed up, tore up from the floor up, in prison. You name it, that should be your pastor. But only by the, I am who I am, and I stand in this place only by the grace of God. Literally, only by the grace of God. And, and, and to add, I should be dead pushing up daisies. I should be, due to the lifestyle that I used to live running the streets of East Oakland. Heaven is real. We've been on a journey for four weeks now. We're going to continue for another two weeks after this. But in light of heaven, the reality and the realness of heaven, just like the breath in your lungs, heaven. It's real. So what I think what God wants to do today is do something unique. In that, answer the question. Here's how we've been posing and really presenting this series. In a series of questions, trying to answer the questions. What will we, be, what will we do in heaven? Uh, how do we get to heaven? Uh, what would our bodies look like? What will relationships look like? We've tried to answer these questions from a biblical standpoint. By the way, if you're a guest, we always want to, this is going to be our main textbook. Amen. Okay. And so this is a different series in that is more topical than exegetical, ex, just kind of expounding on one particular verse and just marinating in a specific text. That makes sense? So we just, we camp out, we put our stakes down and we just dig and we eat. This is a little bit different, more topical. In essence, what we're doing in this series is more biblical theology from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And what does the Bible have to say about heaven? It gives us a lot of insight in regards to it. But I, I'm telling you something. I'm telling you something. I know that we and people say that we live in the most illiterate uh, culture when it comes to biblical principles and living. But I want to push back on that statement in that the word illiterate actually means one who cannot read. So I wouldn't say that we live in an illiterate culture. I would actually say the other word that's akin or cousin to the word illiterate is illiterate or illiterate. In a sense of this word, illiterate, it means one who can read but chooses not to read. There's a difference. And that's actually the difference between how you view heaven and how you see Jesus, how you live on this side of heaven. Let me, let me illustrate it in this way. Uh, cats and dogs. <laughs> we had a dog and it's still in our family, but it's at my in-laws, my mother-in-law house. Amen. But it's still in the family. Amen. So as we tell the kids, so daddy don't get crucified, right? I mean, here it is. I mean, it's the dog is still in our family, but cats and dogs, a little bit different. Can we do a little cats and dog theology this morning? Dogs that when you get home, they're, they're excited to see you. Dogs are elated. They're, they're, they're wagging the tail. They are, they're trying to find where you're at. I mean, they'll run to you specifically. They will lick your hand in submission. They will actually, man, man I, I know who feeds me. I know who's going to give me my water. I know who's going to put the chain on my neck and take me out. I mean, they just, they just want to they just want to be in the presence of their owner. There's a respect. Cats, on the other hand, 
<laughs> if you have a cat, I'm, I'm literally, I'm praying for you. Amen. Y'all see my fingers when I do this? I'm thinking, I'm praying for you. Cats, on the other hand, cats, when you come in, they, they get a little they're pious. Tail go all up like this here, right? They go wandering off. They actually go walk away from you. They don't even come towards you. They give you this look. They may come brush on your leg a little bit, do the little deal, but, but it's more so, hey, um, uh, cats like to articulate it this way. If you want to deal with dog and cat theology, cats would think that it's their world and we live in it. A dog, on the other hand, will say, no, I realize you're the master, you're in control, Check this out. You're the center of everything, and I need to respond in regards to that. I wonder how many of us in this room this morning, and those watching online, you've kind of journeyed in the Christian journey, and you're trying to figure this thing out, but you've realized, man, I've actually, up until this point, I realized that I have more of a cat theology than a dog theology. Because I really believe this is going to be the breaking point for some of us in regards to answering the question this morning, what will we do in heaven? What will we do in heaven? It's a big question. It's loaded. There's a lot of misconceptions. We're not going to just be sitting around again on clouds with wings, playing harps. I ran across Thomas Kincaid's rendition of heaven this this week. And I mean, he had some things on point, but some of it was just, it, it was a beautiful picture, but it was off. In fact, they had, he had like, um, he had little babies with wings sitting on clouds. I'm like, okay, we talked about that. Baby's going to be there, full show, right? Those who go on and they, they, they don't know the Lord, but they demise early. But, but the wings part, I don't know. They had people standing at the gate, checking in, had a check-in booth. I mean, you go check it out. Thomas Kincaid, Kincaid's rendition of heaven. Now, how you view heaven, though, will determine how you act down here. Will I have a cat theology or will I have, God, you're the center? I'm preaching to myself. Will I have a cat theology? No, God, you're in my world. It's my world and you just live in it. Or, God, I realize, as we've already studied, and you are the centerpiece of all of creation. You're the greatest personality to break the horizon of all of creation, existence, Everything centers around you. As a matter of fact, um, week one, we talked about he's the center of heaven. And we're going to see this morning, he's seated on the throne in heaven. So as he taught the disciples, Lord, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I wonder, I wonder. This morning, you're going to discover if you have a cat theology or a dog theology. In regards to what he wants us to do. We're not going to be bored. I tell you that. As a matter of fact, I would say heaven is going to be a blast. Everybody say a blast. It's going to be a blast. It's going to blow your mind. I'm going to to actually open up some stuff today that you may go, I've never thought about that. Well, that's the whole point of this series. Amen. But here it is. Here's what Paul says to the church gone wild in Corinth. We wanted to get into the context really bad. But he wanted to shift their thinking in regards to God's power, uh, who they ought to be yoking themselves to. Um, who they ought to emulate, follow, all that good stuff, more of a kingdom vertical mindset. He says this in chapter one, verses t- uh, chapter two and nine. He says, but as it is written, now I want y'all to see something. What no eye has what? Oh, hey, we see a lot, but guess what? We hadn't seen what God has in store. Nor ear heard, nor the heart of man, this word imagined, is beautiful. You know what it means? Let me just draw over here. It means your highest thought falls short. Our hearts cannot imagine what God is in store and what he's in store for us. As a matter of fact, it's kind of amazing. Clayton hit on this last week. He said God had created everything, all of creation in six days. And for 2,000 years, Jesus has been preparing a place for you. How profound. So our hearts, the hearts of man, man, woman, boy, and girl, can't even imagine what God has. Here's this word. It lets us know, again, this is an actual physical place. He's preparing something. We hadn't seen it. We haven't heard it. We haven't imagined it. Even with our greatest 
thought of what God is actually doing in heaven and what it's going to look like, it still falls short because it's going to blow our minds. Heaven going to be a blast, y'all. Well, God has prepared for those who love, who love him. So what are we going to do in heaven? Out of the gate, you better rest assured we're going to worship. If Jesus is the centerpiece of all of creation, and we're going to always be reminded from the fact that he was raised in bodily form, this is the importance of why the gospel writers highlighted this, that Jesus was resurrected in bodily form. Stay with me. There's multiple implications. He's the first fruit from the grave, but also, as he told Thomas, I want you to put your hands here in this hole and, and put your, your hand in my side to discover and see that I'm actually real. I've risen. And the disciples said that they seen me. You was all out of whack. Said, no, I got to see his hands and, and see his side. And, and so Jesus, what he do? He walks into to this room while the disciples are amongst themselves goes right through the door and he goes right to Thomas. Thomas did come on bud come on hey bud but then he drops a nugget he says you believe because you what more blessed of those who what isn't that crazy so here it is this picture of bodily form he would reveal himself on the road of Emmaus to the disciples I really believe we're going we're gonna to talk about fellowship in just a little bit. But I believe, I mean, they, were, they caught fish and had a fish fry. We're going to eat some fish in heaven, I'll tell you that. But in bodily form, Jesus is the focal point. Watch this. Watch what the text says. He's the, he's the centerpiece. You've got to ask yourself this question. Do you have a cat theology? This was very convicting this week. A cat theology. You know, God, no, it's really my agenda. I want to tag you onto it. I'll pray about it later, but I'm going to just do it. Hey, Mike, can we, can we, are we real people here? I want to force the issue and then hopefully you check off on it. That's a cat theology. God, here's your will. Whatever you want to do, I'm going to want to submit to it. I'm preaching to myself. I uh, mean, man, just your will is perfect. Uh, I may not understand everything, but you're the centerpiece in heaven. But guess what? Not just in heaven. You're also, you should be the centerpiece on earth, in my heart. So if that's the case, a lot of what we're going to do in heaven, watch this statement. A lot of what we're going to do in heaven are some things that we ought to be doing right now on earth. So that means when we have church on Sunday, this is why we have this great, this um, in our core values. How are we going to actually fulfill our mission and vision? We, we, are, we, are, we worship a risen Savior. That means we want to worship him and help you guys worship him, have a dynamic walk with Jesus to worship him from Sunday to Sunday. Why from Sunday to Sunday? I need more than a, just a Monday morning faith. I need more beyond Sunday. Help me do this. Why? Because if we're going to do this in heaven, we ought to be doing it down here. Here's why. The two is empty from Sunday to Sunday. So we're going to worship. Watch what the text say. Watch this. Then I look now, by the way, Revelation man is cold, man. John, he, he, man, I'm telling you, his assignment was crazy. The stuff he was able to see and hear. He's going to tell us a little bit about it right here. Then I looked and I heard around the throne. And let me just, let me just see, we don't think about this. You read this. Um, if you know Jesus, you're going to be here too. How about that? Around the throne. And the living creatures and the elders and the voices of many angels. How many? Numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. Watch this. He says, saying with a loud voice. Now, I know everybody worship differently. And I'm a loud dude, man. I know, I know you can't tell, right? All right, so... I'm a loud dude. And let me just say this. I said that I joke with my the executive team. You know, black people, African Americans, we, we, we're, we're demonstrative. <laughs> it's not that we're just loud, we're just passionate. Amen. Yeah. So, but that's the whole, I'm never, you, you can contemplate internally and just kind of worship inwardly, but there's a gathering when we get to heaven. When we get to heaven, the, the Bible says that it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a loud voice. That's what he heard. John heard it. It's not Mark is saying this. Heard a loud, he says, voice in unison. And I failed to mention this in the first week. The Bible said that there will be no more sea. There'll be no more sea. And in Jewish culture, 
Well, in the early Bible days, they, would, they saw the sea as almost like they were afraid of it in that it separated, you know, continents and things of that nature, but also enemies coming in. And, and so there's this great fear and just the, the, the depth, if you will, of it. But the sea, there'll be no more sea. Not necessarily this. In other words, he's saying there'll be nothing that divides us. There's nothing that's going to divide us. So this one voice is going to be unified. So in other words, there's not going to be a, a Baptist section in heaven. There's not going to be a Presbyterian section in heaven. Can we go there? Ah, there's going to be one voice. It's going to be loud. I don't think they're going to give us earplugs when you get there. One voice, and here's what everybody, no C, which is a picture of division, but there'll be no more C. And this is what it means and just in Jewish culture and writing, the sea, no more. Nothing's going to divide us. We'll be unified. And there's one voice saying, worthy, worthy, worth, um, a weight, um, um, adoration. Everything belongs to you. It won't be like a certain section going, ah, that's what y'all think, but not over here. No, 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 no. In unison, worthy is a lamb who was slain. And by the way, same context, we'll talk about, this is a, he's the only one who's able to unroll the scroll. To receive. So that means we're giving something. Y'all see this? To receive. If he's receiving what? And from who? Well, from us because we're worshiping him. To receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Watch what he say. Then he says this, man, hey, here it is. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Let me just tell you this. Church, God gives us time, air, an existence to give him praise now. I'm just gonna tell you this. I know days are you don't feel like praising, but my, my grandma used to tell me this, boy, you better, you better, you better praise anyway. Amen. You better, you better praise. He's still good, regardless of what you go through. God is still good. So here it is. Just what I'm gonna say about this statement. Either you give it to the Lord now, or he's gonna take it from you later. Here it is. And I heard I'm not making this up. Every that means. You, every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth, everything, even a little ugly little stuff and down in the sea, they're going to be like this. Octopus is going to be like, hey, look, I knew it all along. Right here it is. <laughs> and all that is in them, oh, all that is in them, what are they going to be doing? Man, I'm going to tell you what they're going to be doing. They're going to be saying this to him who, man, sits on the throne. A place of power. It's done. Also a place of worth majesty on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory weight doxa uh, and might forever and how long so to some degree it, it's not gonna be a long boring worship service but but it's gonna be it's gonna be a party we're gonna worship him now, now this is the crazy part and the four living creatures said i'm gonna deal with the four living creatures later in the series on revelation i did say that out loud amen and the Lord and the four living creatures said, they just said, amen. We've seen it all along. We've been witnessing this forever. Amen. This is right. There's, a, there's some things we just ought to do. They're saying, hey, we've seen it all along. Um, did I change that? Uh, oh, here you go. Boom. They're saying, look, hey, we've seen this all along. Y'all are just coming alongside of what we've already known. And the elders fell down and they worship. It's going to be a unit. It's going to be a big party, y'all. That's what it's saying. Man, worship. Why? Because he's a centerpiece. Do you have a, when it comes to worship. We, now, we did really good. But think about seeing Jesus face to face. Man, I, again, I don't know what he, what he looks like. I'm not going to sit here and tell you he's a, a blue-eyed, blonde hair frail dude. I'm not, I'm not doing that. I don't know what he looks like, but I do know that the Bible gives us a little bit of a glimpse. It said his hair looked like wool. Now again, y'all, y'all don't throw nothing at me. I'm just saying his hair was like wool. This is the description that the Bible gives about God. Oh, Jesus. His skin was like that of anybody know? Bronze. Mm, Y'all know the color of bronze? 
His eyes were like what? Fire. So the depiction that we have in American culture and Western civilization is way off. So some of us, you don't get to heaven and be like, oh, snap, I, I had it wrong. <laughs> hey. Hey, yo, Peter, hey, is this the right place, cuz? <laughs> Boom. You're going to see him. Like, we all going to see him. We're going to see him. You will see him. You're going to see him. And here's the thing. He's going to know you. Out of the thousands and the myriads and the myriads and the thousands and the thousands, he's going to know you by name. So that leads me to the next point. We're going to worship him. We're going to worship him. I want to hey, I'm telling you what. We're going to worship him, but we're also going to do this. It's going to be cold up there. We're going we're to fellowship. We're going to fellowship. Rocky, where mother slide go? You in here? You leave, Rocky? Rocky, where you at? Okay, boom. Robes. Okay, boom. All right. This may be just, okay, here it is. Maybe not. We're going to fellowship. Here's what I mean. If you have your Bibles, you can look at Hebrews chapter 12, 22 through 23. I'm going to read it. That thing did some old. That's the devil there. That thing did some weird stuff on me. Here it is. Here's what the text says. I want you all to see something. Actually, I'm gonna get, I got to find it on the screen because I want to draw. Hebrews chapter 12, 22 through 23. You're welcome. Look at that. Bold with it. Pastor repeat it. I like it. No shame in her game. She's going to be a part of that loud crowd in, in, in heaven. There it is. Got you, sis. All right, here it is. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Here it is. All right. Cody caught that. But you have, notice this. This is what the text says. But you have come to Mount Zion. There is a, there's a place called Zion. There's a Mount Zion. And then there's a city of Zion. And then within the place of, in the city of Zion, there's a, there's a physical location Zion, which was highlighted and known as the church. But in this case, the writer of Hebrews, he actually coins it as God's presence. Now, let me back up a little bit about worship. We will worship him. Why? Because there'll be no temples in heaven. There'll be no temples. Maybe you're like, oh, snap, I didn't know that. There'll be no, why? Because a temple was naturally a place where God's presence would dwell. There'll be no temples. Why? Because we will always for eternity be in God's what? Presence. So, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. Oh, this is cold. The heavenly Jerusalem and to innumerable, if you will, angels. And here's this word here. Check this out. This, best, this basically means celebration. It's part of the feast and the Jewish culture, what they would do. But he says this, this celebration is a part of other people. This gathering is, is, is about fellowship. There's going to be breaking of it's going to be breaking of bread. You'll be able to look people in their eyes. This is going to be a celebration. This is what the Bible is saying. And by the way, this is not just the writer in Hebrew saying this. Jesus will say this even at the Lord's Supper. Again, we mentioned this in week one. When Jesus was doing something, he was never flippantly just going about doing things. Whether practices, whether what he was saying, Jesus was highlighting. If he was speaking doctrine, he embodied doctrine, thus even as he instrumented different deals to say the Lord's Supper, he said on the back end, he said this, that uh, we take this right now, but I'm not going to take it again to win. Come on, church. Until I come back and you're going to be with me. The marriage feast of the Lamb. Revelation 19 and 9. Jesus was dining with them, reclining at table because he was highlighting what it's going to actually look like with us in heaven. You know the cold part about this? Revelation chapter 2 talks about how there's going to be a stone. Revelation 2, there's going to be a stone, and this white stone etched on the stone. I'm not talking about Pinterest, but etched on the stone is going to be a name. Hear me say this, guys. I'm still floored by this. This, this floors me. There's going to be a name on the stone. Chad actually mentioned this, but there's a seat at the table. You can have a place at the table. And on this white stone, the Bible says, it's going gonna, it's gonna to read multiple, maybe a couple things. One, he's going to give it to those who, who endure or conquer. That's what the Bible says. But also it could mean, many theologians mean this, that 
It's to the one that conquered, that Jesus was the stone that you trusted in. You have a place at the table now, but not only that, on this stone etched in it, it's going to be something like this. Man, he's going to look at a certain people. He's going to look at, man, Josh, have your place at the, at the table. Can you imagine your seat at the table? Ain't nobody be like, man, move. This is my seat. Ain't going to be none of that. Move, move, move. Scoot down. I need, I need man space. You know what I mean? We ain't doing all that. It's going to say faithful. You know what the cold part about it is? When he hands that stone and places it there, you're going to see his hands. You're going to see his hands that, are, that was wounded and pierced for your sin and my sin, for your transgression and my transgression. Actually, you know this, the Bible declares that he's going to serve us. Have you all thought about that? That when we get to heaven, think of this, for all of eternity, we're going to learn. We're not going to put on God's infinite, eternal attributes. We're always going to be learning. But in essence, he's going to serve us at this, this grand feast. Just think of this. We're going to be at this table. I don't know how long this table is going to be. Maybe we'll eat in just different increments and shifts. I don't know. God can pull it off. But regardless of the fact, we're going to eat, and at this table is going to be these stones with this name written about it. Some of y'all is going to say, man, you, you're joy. Some of y'all is going to say, patience. Not many of us are going to have that stone. But anyway, but... But I don't know what the stone. You're going to have a name. You have a seat with a, with a specific name, and you're going to see Jesus is going to place you. His hands. Can you see his hands? So we're going to fellowship. So that calls into question eating. <laughs> Revelation 2 also talks about how he'll be given to us uh, hidden manna. Well, I thought all the manna was given out in the Old Testament. He's going to be giving us something else. So indicating that we're actually going to eat. Which argues another question. So if we're going to eat, are we going to digest? See, see, how many of y'all ever thought about that? Just be honest. Don't lie in church. Do not. You may fall over and demise. <laughs> Have you ever thought about eating in heaven and then going, man, what? Just, it's just going, what, you know, what, what's popping? Okay. Think of it this way. Jesus was 100% God. I ought to be careful with this statement, but also in the fullness of what it means, the hypostatic union. 100% God, 100% man. So you mean to tell me, as the writer in Hebrews again will say, we have a great high priest who sympathizes with us. He was like us, tempted in every way, but yet without sin, he was 100% man, not some rendition, not some made up stuff like some other thoughts in schools would think of. He was just like us. So much so that he would eat with the disciples. Think theologically. Jesus had a digestive tract. When was the last, if we, we never think of this. For some reason, we just we romanticize the Bible and go, well, man, what happened? So, well, hold on. Well, a lot of the things that we're doing down here, we're actually going to be doing in heaven. But see, here's the deal with this. No gluttony. We're going to talk about balance in just a little bit. No gluttony. We're, gonna, we're about overeating and weight issues and insecurity. Some of us, we're, 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 we're literally shackled by that. I know it. I know some of you specifically. Shackled by insecurity, what everybody's thinking about you, how I look, and oh my gosh, and ladies, me raising three girls, man, that is more pertinent, man, than I ever thought in my life. My girls always ask me, Daddy, how do I look? How do I look, Daddy? Girl, you look beautiful. Just the way God intended you to look, you look beautiful. And don't let nobody else tell you different. But there's this issue on it. There's this issue in our culture. We have a, a me-centered cat theology. Everything is about us. So, man, I've got to worry about what everybody else say about me. No, 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 no. When we, when we eat there, it's going to be, we're going to enjoy it. And, and some people would argue that um, from verses like 1 Corinthians 6, 13, that uh, when Paul talks about how the Lord is going to do away with the body, he said, all things are lawful, but then all things are, you know, just profitable to me. That's the context. Many would say, no, well, well then we're not going to eat then. Well, and then you have hunger and thirst. The Bible says that he's going to literally lead us to, he's going to lead you and I 
to the river, to the living water, to the living stream in heaven that God himself is going to lead us. That indicates what predicates someone needing water. You're thirsty. But this, this would be an unquenchable, undes- just a, a complete satisfaction of what it means to actually uh, be fulfilled. And so they won't be in a sense of like loss, or, oh my gosh, and like starvation and things, none of that, man. All that, God's going to deal away with that in, the perfect, in this perfect place coming. Uh, there's so much with that one, fellowship, eating, drinking, um, sports, things of that nature. Dogs, not cats. But the next one is interesting. Why? Because we all serve somebody. We will serve as well. So we're going to fellowship. Guys, we're going to break bread. Jesus on the road to Emmaus, after he broke bread, after the resurrection, which again is a a great indication. Jesus wasn't just flippantly walking around the streets. He was revealing himself to people. Um, But also showcasing, man, this is what is, man, we're going to actually break, we're going to fellowship. We're going to eat. And so we're also going to serve. This one is interesting. Because again, if you say, well, man, pastor, maybe we're going to serve. Some of y'all are like, dang, I thought I was going to go up there and just be kicking it. No. Uh Uh-uh. Watch this. Watch what the text say. Therefore, they are before the throne. Who's before the throne? We're going to be. And what are we going to do, the Bible says? When? In this temple. So in other words, what he's doing here, he's doing a play on words. Notice this. Watch this. Because I prefaced a little while ago that there's no temple, but ultimately it's his presence. Day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. So we're going to serve him. No longer will there be any, uh, anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship, worship him. Don't you think that's only fitting? Have you ever thought about this? Like why we ought to serve and why Jesus is the centerpiece of all, everything in heaven. Just think of this this way. Think of it. Think of it. If, if we all could work our way to heaven, what would be the focal point of heaven? Logically. Think of it. If everybody worked their way to get there. This is why Jesus said in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Think of this. When we all get to heaven, if all of us in this room and those online you're watching, we just burst our way in there. Man, what would you do? Man, I went to church every single day for all of my life. But I never confessed Jesus. Uh, I helped a lot of people cross the street. Uh, I helped, uh, uh, whatever, works. I try to make myself holy and righteous, whatever the case may be. If all of us did that, what would be the focal point of heaven? Who would be the focal point of heaven? Who would we worship? Cat theology. It breaks down theologically. So there has to be, by the way, if you don't notice or not, all of us, we are wired to worship and we are wired to serve. And so, we all serve somebody. I don't know who you're serving. Somebody said, well, amen. Some of us serving ourselves. Some of us serving our own agendas. In heaven, there will be no agendas. There will be no ill will. There will be no manipulation. We will serve him, and we would find joy in actually serving the Lord. There will be a real joy. Like, man, God, man, this is what I ought to be doing. It's not... Pastor Marcus and, and, the, and the pastoral team twisted my arm. And mind you, I did say this, that what we're going to be doing in heaven is a picture of what we ought to be doing down here. So this argues a question. Many of us, we come to church and we just sit. Uh-oh. We, we sit and we, we treat church like a restaurant. When you go to a restaurant, I don't know about y'all, but there's one thing that just trips me out every single time about a restaurant. They come in, they serve you a little food, got your little wop, wop, whoop, whoop, right? Bang, put it there. And then you get it, you hungry, especially if you've been waiting for a while, and then you see a piece of hair in your food. Anybody? Don't that mess you up? I mean, you see, I mean, it's like, the dish can be like looking phenomenal, but that one little hair, you're like, oh, no. Uh, excuse me, waitress or waiter, <laughs> you know, you, 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 come on over here. And you try to be polite about it. Well, I have a hair follicle in my, you know, you try to be all nice about it. And then they look and they'll take it back. L- let a silverware or something not be clean. Anybody ever been there? 
You're really quick to be like, hey. So a lot of us, we treat church that way. Pastor, I don't like what you're doing, so hey. Let me email. <laughs> Y'all seen that little deal with the cat? Y'all know everybody's seen that one, right? I get it and I just send it off. Amen. So I'll respond to some of them. But, but here's the deal. We, we complain. And if we're doing something straight unbiblical, then that's rightfully so. But wanting to see the Great Commission go forward, wanting to see you actually embrace authentic relationships, worship the Lord passionately, uh, live on mission, being a part of this, this dynamic of serving. And by the way, there's no threshold when you get to heaven. When you leave this side and go to the other side, there's no eraser threshold. Here's what I mean. It's not as if you get to this point of demise, you have the, the um, hyphen moment, and then whenever you pass away, there's no eraser. It's not like, Pastor Marcus, when I get to the precipice of death, that I'm going to turn like to a white man. That's not going to happen. We already discovered this. We're going to recognize, stay with me here logically, we're going to recognize people. Mike Giblin, you with me? We're going to recognize, and even this, what God has wired us with, with on this side was serving He's going to flip and use it on this side in heaven. So this is a major stewardship thing now. Now it looks a little bit different when the Lord looks at you and you're standing before him, Matthew uh, 25, I believe, and he says, good and faithful servant, job well what? You've been faithful over a little, now I'm going to trust what to you? More. So that talks about we're going to rule with him on the back end. But think of this, restaurant, restaurants. There's no threshold. It's like, you know, man, I'm just going to and be a race and then like, oh, I'm look like so-and-so. No, you're going you to look like you. Tell yourself that. I'm going to look like me. Come on, y'all. But in a glorified body. But when you're at home eating, I remember being, my mom, man, hey, stepdad, everything, they'd be like, boy, I don't like this. Excuse me? That's not an option. Or I don't want to do the dishes. I mean, it's funny because I remember my girls one time, they say, Daddy, will you please stop using us as an analogy? I said, well, until you get out of my house. Uh, that didn't. <laughs> you, are, you are a walking analogy, amen. <laughs> so, but yeah, I came home one day from traveling and walked in. Mandy was hot. I think I shared this before, but it's, it's very fitting. It's very fitting for the moment. Mandy was hot. And when Mandy is silent, that's when everybody better take cover. When she like silent, you better take cover. Here it is. So I came home and said, okay, babe, what's going on? Oh, man, they just, these girls driving me 5150, straight crazy. Okay, where are they at? They're sitting in the den. So I go in there and little sitting in the den, and, you know, they were all smaller then, and little legs couldn't even touch the ground, just swinging at little legs. Y'all see them, right, just doing a little deal. I said, girls, what's the problem? What is the problemo? I said, well, daddy, we don't think we need to wash dishes. I said, okay, is there anything else? Oh, yeah, we don't need, we, we don't need to fold our clothes. And we don't need to clean our room either. Had a little neck thing going. I said, man, you better watch out. And they, uh, right, right? The Bible says, spare not the rod. Amen. Some of you are like, oh my gosh, Pastor, he whoops this kid. No, I do not. I mean, guys, come on, man. Get a biblical life. Amen. Joseph Stowe. But, but I said, is there anything else? Oh, yeah, well, you know, uh, we, don't, we don't need to. I said, okay, well. Uh, why don't y'all go to the grocery store then? Right? Uh, oh, yeah, by the way, you need food. I mean, you need money to actually purchase stuff at the grocery store. Oh, yeah, by the way. Oh, man, you need a car. You need a vehicle, right? You need a car to actually get to the grocery store. And then I said, hey, man, um, let's, just, let's just squash it. Why don't y'all, why don't y'all, y'all need to pay the mortgage too. Pay the mortgage. One of them had a nerve tell me. I'm not going to tell you which one it was. But one of them said, no, that's your job. You see what I'm saying? Y'all see what I'm saying? Y'all feel what I'm saying? That's just in my house. How do you think God feels about his house? Oh, that's your job, pastor. Come on, guys. We ought to have, there should be no issue. This is a commercial for serving in the church. Yes, it is, because what we're going to do in heaven, a lot of it we're going to be doing down here already. A lot of us, we treat it like this. This is a cat theology. No, Pastor, I have a restaurant theology. I have a cat theology. No, I just, it's about me. Now, you just tickle my ears. I, matter of fact, I ain't tickling your ears. 
Or God, you know, you're the centerpiece and I'm, I'm here for your glory. I'm here to worship you. I'm here to fellowship with you and you with me. And the only way I can do this is through the blood and, and the work of Jesus Christ, his resurrection. This is the only reason I'm made able to actually go back to the relationship. Man, here's the deal. Guys, God cares about his house. So the question is, who are you serving? God has wired you to serve. He's wired all of us to do something specific. That means then that there's a, everybody has a purpose. Literally. There's no accidents. You're not accidents. Somebody need to hear that today. You're not an accident. So we're going to actually serve the Lord in, in heaven. But are you serving him now? That's the big question. We're also going to work. Some of you are like, dang. Real quick, we're almost done. A couple more. We're going to work. We're going to work. Isaiah talks about this. If you have your Bibles, you get me. I, again, I'll send this to you guys. Don't worry about it. Isaiah talks about this. Check this out. They shall. Well, I'm talking about who's that? Who are they? Well, you. They shall build houses. And if you go and look at the, the heading, the heading of this is the new heavens and the new earth. Again, this great picture. Isaiah's painting it. They shall, in this new place, they shall, what are they going to do? So this means, this, we, it's going to be, it's not what you think. We're going to be building stuff. It's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be fun. But here, here's the deal. We're going to build stuff and not be exhausted like that. Like worn out, burnt out. Anybody ever feel burned out? Some of you are like, man, I ain't going into work today. Somebody say something to me, I'm, gonna, I'm just going, right? You know what I mean? I'm burned out. It's not going to be that. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards. Oh, man, we're going to plant too? Yeah, we're going to plant. We're going to eat from the fruit of it. They shall not build. Check this out. This is really cool. They shall not build and another inhabit. So in other words, ain't going to be no smooching in heaven. Ain't going to be downstairs in your mama's basement at 34 playing video games. If you're a grown man and you're still playing video games, it's okay, but not all the time. I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> but another inhabit, no leeching. They shall not plant and another eat. Y'all see this? Look, go back and read the Bible, guys. I want y'all to do your own research. For like the days of the tree, uh, a tree shall the days of my people be. He says, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work. This is the key part. They shall long enjoy the work, what? Having purpose in it. Some of y'all, you're wasting so much time doing what you're doing, you have no purpose in it. You're just spinning your wheels and trying to find endeavors, build platforms, be known and whatever. Man, God is saying, look, if you rest in me, you trust in me, and that's going to be our next thought. We're going to work, but also we're going to rest. But if you rest in me and find your purpose in me, I'm going to give you, you'll have a different joy, a different fulfillment like never before. All right? So we will work. We're going to rest too. The fullness of what the word means. I, I, let me just say this. We're going to have balance. We're going to have Balance. That's a scary word. I know. He's like, man, pastor, man, I just I overwork. I, I overcommit. How many of y'all have an overcommitting problem? Anybody in the room? If we just tell, just tell the truth, overcommit. I got to get stuff done. Overcommit, overcommit. No, here's the deal. In heaven, there's going to be a balance. We're going to work. We're also going to rest. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord uh, from now on. Well, Why? Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may, they may rest. Wrong color. Oh, I did a paintbrush. Oh, that's cool. We can do paintbrushes too. Man, I'm about to be out here doing all type of stuff. Amen, amen. Rest from their what? For their deeds follow them. In other words, they're going to benefit from it. We're going to rest. We're going to understand what it really means to have balance. Healthy, healthy balance. And here's the deal. God doesn't, he's not against work. He's just against work having you. Amen. He's not against stuff, but he's against stuff having you. Again, if he's a center point, he wants to be the center point. And lastly, we will rule. We're rule. Watch this. We're going to rule. 
This one is a fun one. I want you, I'm going to give you a little homework. I want you guys to go home this week and, um, and look at this Matthew text I'm going to give you. But here it is. The Lord in the beginning gave them uh, work and a responsibility, Adam and Eve, before the fall. But he also gave them a specific assignment. He gave them a task. God is very, God is very purposeful. He says this, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Right? And have, uh oh, here's a word. See, what happened when we decided, maybe some of y'all don't know this, but when we decided, Adam and Eve decided to disobey the Lord's voice, that dominion went over to Satan. So just think of it this way on this redemptive plan, God is bringing everybody back. He's bringing us back to Eden. That makes sense? To this dominion. So we'll rule. We're going to come back, man, rolling with him. There's going to be governments. There's going to be different stuff. Okay? But this text here, I want you to go back and just do a little research on it. This is the talents. And some of you say, oh, I never really studied it. Studied it. It's specifically talking about what we're going to do in heaven. So, that's a snapshot. I'll tell you this. We're not going to be bored. There's no retiring in heaven. You're not going to be bored. You're not going to sit around and twirl your thumbs. God has something for you to do. What's, what's amazing, because if we're going to serve him, again, he has something in mind. Ephesians 2 and 10. He created you and me before time existed to be his workmanship in Christ Jesus to do these things before time existed. So, like God has this, he knows what he's doing. So the question again, man, how do you, do you have, as we close, Chad, come on up, guys. Do you have a cat theology? Literally, God, everything is really about me. Everything is about me. The church is about me. I mean, music, I want everything to be, or do you have a, no, here's what it's like. God, I want you to be the centerpiece of everything. So, Father, we love you. Thank you for